Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December 11th, 2023. My name is Tim, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. The CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and the CircuitPython project, consider purchasing hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting gets hosted on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel, as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically occurs on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern US time and 11 a.m. Pacific time, uh, except when that coincides with the US holiday, in which case uh, we will either bump the meeting typically to a Tuesday or just uh, skip the week, which I think we have uh, one upcoming towards the end of the year, but I need to look into the calendar for that. Um, let's see here. The notes document that accompanies the meeting is in the pinned message. That's a Google Notes doc that's shared with everyone. Uh, you can contribute to the document before the meeting begins. The final notes document, including timestamps uh, to go along with the video, uh, excuse me, the final notes document does include timestamps so that it can go along with the video. Uh, the meeting tends to run from 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how many folks we have. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel. Uh, on the Adafruit Discord. You can check the pinned messages there throughout the week to find the latest note stock, and you can always add your notes, uh, hug reports, and status updates to that doc throughout the week. You don't have to wait for Monday if you uh, happen to think of it before. Uh, as usual, the meeting is going to be held in five parts. The first part will be community news. That's going to be a look at everything CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. Uh, that's a chosen set of items from the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out on Mondays. Uh, the second part of the meeting will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. That one is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It'll give us a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. Uh, the third part, and the first of our two round robins, is the Hug Reports section. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing. can take a moment to recognize the awesome folks in our community. The fourth part, and the uh, second of our two round robins, is the Status Updates section. Status Updates is an opportunity to report on what we've been up to, so you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to uh, over the next week until we meet up next time. The fifth and final part of the meeting is in the weeds. That's an opportunity for some more long-form discussions. Those can either come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time as something that's going to be too long or in-depth uh, for status updates. So that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, with that, I will take our first timestamp and get us into community news. There we go. Uh, in news... This week in the newsletter, uh, CircuitPython 8.2.9 was released. So uh, CircuitPython version 8.2.9 is the latest bug fix revision of CircuitPython uh, and is the new stable release. There is a link here in the doc to the Adafruit blog as well as the GitHub release notes. Uh, and I threw in the bulleted list of the notable changes since 8.2.8. Those include a PO, PIO DMA fix for the RP2040, uh, new and removed boards, as well as individual board fixes are in that 829 release. Next up, we have uh, Raspberry Pi releases the HAT Plus standard and more on PCIe. Two months after the announcement of the Raspberry Pi 5, additional details have been released on the hardware. Specifications on the PCIe connector and required cabling will help hardware developers adhere to hardware specifications. Uh, in addition, the new HAT Plus specification updates the 2014 HAT standard for signaling between peripherals and computer. Uh, there are links here to the Raspberry Pi news as well as a couple of those other more specific uh, documentation, oops, uh, documentation links on that protocol. Uh, next up, we have the first Raspberry Pi OS update since the Pi 5 has uh, added some new features. So Raspberry Pi OS has now been updated to fix bugs since the uh, launch of the initial bookworm version. The update also includes improved support for encrypted connections in WAVNC, uh, the latest version of Thonny, 
Mathematica and Scratch 3 are uh, now all working on the Raspberry Pi 5, and a bunch of other small bug fixes and tweaks are included as well. Uh, finally, an often requested feature, uh, Dark Mode, uh, which is definitely one that caught my eye. I'm a Dark Mode user for sure. So there are links here to the Raspberry Pi news as well as the register if you want to check out more about that uh, new Raspberry Pi OS that was released. Uh, next up and the final newsletter item for the week was the project of the week. This was a CircuitPython powered typewriter. Uh, Max Lupo writes about a CircuitPython powered typewriter project. The project uses an Adafruit uh, KB2040 board to send parallel data to the uh, Vintage Electronic Typewriter via its Centronix Parallel port. There are links here to GitHub. Uh, if you want to check into the code or try to recreate this for yourself, there's also a link to Mastodon where uh, Max posted about this project. And that was looking really cool, I thought. So I'm definitely going to take a closer look into that one later on. So all of these items and more are from the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter, uh, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter that's emailed every Monday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest in Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or product, uh, excuse me, project, you can edit the next week's draft on GitHub, uh, open up a pull request there with your edits to the draft file. You can also send an email over to cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Macedon Blue Sky or Twitter, uh, or uh, Twitter's new name X. So um, next up, let me take next timestamp for the new section, which will be the State of CircuitPython, the Libraries, and Blinka. Uh, the State of CircuitPython, the Libraries, and Blinka, this one is the quantitative overview of the entire project. That's going to give us a chance to look at the health of the project uh, separate from our status updates. So first we'll talk about the project overall, and then we'll dive into the core, the libraries, and Blinka individually, or separately, I should say. So I'll give you the uh, overall stats for the week. We had, across the whole project, uh, 43 pull requests merged by 14 authors. Uh, uh, there was actually quite a few names in here that were uh, newer, at least to me, or um, you know, less, uh, less recognized by me at least. So these folks might be newer or less frequent contributors, uh, or it may just be the case that I didn't happen to recognize their name. Uh, their contributions are uh, appreciated uh, in any case. Those users this week were uh, Hex That, Deep Circuit, uh, How to Flow, Maywolf Sky, King Faroo, and Knockman. So thank you to those folks, as well as all of our other authors for the week. Uh, for those 43 pull requests, uh, we had seven reviewers to take a look at them. Uh, thank you to our team of reviewers, which does look like the usual uh, folks, so I won't list, but we do definitely, as always, very much appreciate them uh, doing the reviews for us. Uh, there were nine closed issues by eight people and 18 new issues opened up uh, by 13 people. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Scott for the core, although it uh, occurs to me I didn't ask Scott if you were available for that. If not, I can take on the score, uh, the core, no problem. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. Uh, let me just find my spot. <clears throat> okay, numbers for the core. Uh, Ten pull requests merged from eight different authors. Uh, Deep Secret, or Deep Circuit <laughs> looks new. Uh, Maywell Sky and No Cumin are uh, rare authors as well, so thanks to those folks. We had four reviewers. Uh, props to Melissa for reviewing as well. Um, we have 15 open pull requests, which is pretty low for us, which is great. We have four closed issues by three people, six open by four people. Uh, so we're now up two for a total of 666 open issues. Uh, we use milestones to track prioritization for Adafruit-funded folks. Um, the most urgent is the A2X, which is stable, and we only have one open issue there. Uh, we have 42 open issues on 9.0. These are the ones that we want to get resolved before we do a 9.0 stable release. And then we have two open issues on 10.0, which will be the next major stable release for us. Uh, we have four issues not assigned to milestone as of these stats, so um, 
we'll have a, a few things to triage, but otherwise be good. But that's it for the core. All right, thanks, Scott. Next up is the libraries. I will send it over to Jeff this week to tell us about the libraries. Hello. Uh, so libraries-wise, we had a pretty high number of pull requests merged, 30. The number of authors was pretty small. I think that, uh, Tim, you did the bulk of these uh, for some library infrastructure update type stuff. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, thank you also to Blab Cockby for uh, your work. Uh, so pull request wise, that leaves us with 63 open pull requests, which range in age from one to 480 days old. And if you uh, are, have one of those open pull requests and would like to move that forward and you're waiting on somebody else, please give a ping on that. Um, issues wise, we saw two closed issues by two people and 11 open by eight people. 698 open issues in total and 19 of those are labeled good first issue. Um, we have a page at circuitpython.org slash contributing that will give you uh, an overview of issues, open pull requests, and so forth. And um, yeah, the, I know there's some other text that I should throw in at this point, but uh, basically we want to enable uh, you to become a contributor to CircuitPython libraries, either as a coder or as a reviewer, to uh, code pick out an issue such as a good first issue from that contributing page, and just uh, give it a try. Maybe you've got the hardware, maybe it's a problem that you say, I would love it if this was fixed for me as well, and uh, dive in and see what you can do. We are around on the CircuitPython Dev channel uh, to answer your questions, and there are also uh, guides on our Adafruit Learn system for the basics of libraries, for the basics of Git and GitHub, and all that stuff. When it comes to reviewing, you can uh, check out open pull requests and uh, give feedback. You can read, and even for things as simple as uh, spelling and grammar in uh, documentation or more complex things, or you can download the code and try it when you have the related hardware, uh, we want to help you learn how to contribute to CircuitPython as well. So just ask us how you can pitch in. And uh, yeah, so that's the spiel. Uh, for contributing to CircuitPython, and now I'll move on to some other statistics. We uh, track our downloads from PyPI, and over the last week there were 175,000, give or take, PyPI downloads of our 232, of our 323 libraries, pardon me. In the document, you can find a list of the top 10 Adafruit bus device is number one, as it usually is. And then we have our list of library updates over the last seven days. There were two new libraries. One is the PyCam camera library, which uh, works with the new Memento board from Adafruit. It's got an app in there that turns it into a point-and-shoot camera that saves uh, JPEGs to a, an SD card, a mode to record a short animated GIF, and some other cool stuff. And we also added to the community bundle a library called the CircuitPython Segment Display, which I have not looked at, but uh, I assume that's about segmented LED displays, such as the seven segment displays, and that's always cool to see. There were also a number of updated libraries, a number which will probably be a lot bigger next week when uh, all these updates from Tim go in. And that is the state of the libraries. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Maker Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. This week we had three pull requests merged by two authors and one reviewer, which is myself. Uh, there were seven open pull requests amongst other repositories. There were three closed issues by three people and one open by one person. And that leaves a net of 80 open issues. Uh, there were 19,629 PyPI downloads in the last week, 8,690 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 126 boards. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Next up is going to be the first of our two round robins, the Hug Reports section. As a reminder, Hug Reports has a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. 
I'll start and then we'll go down the list as they appear in the document. Uh, give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, then I'll read uh, the notes for you once we get to you in the list. Um, so I will get us started here once I take the first timestamp. Uh, my hard reports for this week, thanks to Scott for reviewing the PRs that came as manual follow-ups to the patch uh, on the libraries, appreciate that. Thanks to Jeff for making a repo uh, settings fix um, and documenting that fix in FAQ on Learn. Um, thanks to both Dan and Jeff uh, for some discussion and advice this morning on Discord dealing with a number of different library infrastructure issues uh, while I was working through those. Appreciate help from both of you. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dan. All right. Um, thanks to Jeff for doing JPEG support, which is going to be in uh, the next um, 900 Alpha. And thanks to uh, Scott for working on Wi-Fi workflow, well, improving the Wi-Fi workflow in various ways and working on a PR to allow access to uh, more drives than just the CircuitPy drive to access to XD cards while you're using Wi-Fi workflow, which will be very handy for people. Okay. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is David Clauda. I will read uh, as well as the next one, DJ Devin, I'll read, and then uh, Jeff, you're up after that. I always appreciate the, uh, the on-deck notice, but I always forget to do it, so this time we got it. Uh, from David Glauda, uh, reports this week for Hug Reports to Anne for cleaning the root, uh, the root of the Learn Systems Guides repo. So basically this is moving the, uh, all the Learn Guide projects into subfolders so that the root of the repo has fewer things in it. Therefore, they can start being listed on the GitHub web pages. Um, so David says thanks to Anne for that. Uh, David also says thanks to Scott for the deep dive uh, and working on wireless SD card access that will help the release of the My Little Hacker board. And David says thanks to me, Foamy Guy, uh, as I frequently see library activity during the weekend, reminding me uh, that a stream took place. Yep. Uh, thanks to David, and it looks like maybe uh, DJ Devin is around after all. DJ Devin? Yep. Yeah. Last minute, just got back. Uh, I'd like to send a hug to Deshipu for advice on display four wire syntax changes in 9.0 to bus display. And if 9.0 is going to have breaking changes that might break everything, then that's a great time to do it. Uh, a hug to Justin, El Pekinen, and Anik Data for being helpful in the help of Circuit Python Discord channel. On many occasions, they've all provided advice to me uh, to point me in the right direction. And Scott, for a nice deep dive on Friday, my best wishes to you and your family. Uh, a hug to Toddbot for an excellent tips and tricks repo that continues to give. Um, I, I constantly find myself uh, referring back to it in order to solve problems. And the more he grows it, the more helpful of a resource that becomes. Uh, to LCMC Ninch on GitHub for fixing an Adafruit sprite button example that was showing uh, slowing down my GUI menu system, which is now running smoothly. That's it. All right. Thank you, DJ Devin. Uh, next up is Jeff. Hello again. So uh, my first hug report is a big one for Anne. You've really leveled up in your Git, and you're now ready to do command line tasks to help others out. That's really awesome. Um, to Dan, thanks for releasing our city improvements to 8.2.x. Uh, outside of CircuitPython, I have a hug for the author of some open source software, UV Tools and Prusa Slicer. Those are open source tools for, um, in this case, making prints on resin printers. I'll say a little more about that down in my um, uh, status update. And finally, of course, the group hug, because you all are awesome. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Next up is Kmatch, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, Kmatch has a hug for Lady Ada and likely Jeff for the Memento camera board, bringing a new way to remember without the need for so many tattoos, uh, which is reference to a movie of the same name. Uh, Kmatch also says uh, group hug to all. So thanks to Kmatch for those. Uh, next up is Liz. Hello. Uh, hug report to Melissa for reviewing the FT5336 library I was working on. Uh, to Jeff for hosting this meeting for me last week when I was under the weather. And group hug. All right. Thanks, Liz. Next up is Maker Melissa. Uh, let's see. I have a hug for Jeff uh, for fixing an issue with the 3.7 inch bar display in CircuitPython and group hug to everyone else. All right, thank you, Melissa. Next up is Mark Gambler, who's text only. 
Mark has a hug report for uh, John Park for the logo, uh, excuse me, the Lego lighting tutorial. I'd been looking for a good solution to doing that for a year. I'll have to check into that one too. That's in my interest as well. Uh, Mark also has a group hug for everyone. I miss being around as much. So thanks to Mark Gambler for leaving those. Uh, and next up and rounding out the hug reports is Scott. Uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, just a quick hug to you for being so helpful and filling in for me on Deep Dive. Absolutely. My pleasure. Yep. Uh, thank you. And next, that will bring us to the status reports. So I'll take a timestamp and tell you about that. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start and then we'll go through the list alphabetically. Uh, when I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to in the next week until the next meeting. It's also an opportunity uh, for folks to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too long for status updates, we can always bump it down to in the weeds to continue it. So I will kick us off. Uh, my status updates uh, for the past week, I ran a library patch with Adabot to fix the docs build, um, specifically inside read the docs when it builds in their infrastructure. Um, and I worked through the ones that didn't take automatically, uh, followed up with a couple manual PRs and a couple other uh, fixes of various things. Um, I also did the release sweep uh, afterwards in order to go and release the each library that has now gotten that new uh, fix from the commit. Um, that one had a much smaller list of uh, things that didn't work automatically, so I've been working back through those uh, today. Um, and then I've got the uh, list down in the weeds of all the ones that I think are um, outside of my um, ability to handle. So um, we've got those at least uh, caught up, though, with the patch and the release on everything, I think, at this point. Um, the other stuff I worked on, uh, or intend to work on, I should say, moving into the, the next week is um, the Circup web workflow. I started this a little bit back, uh, set it down when I started doing the patch, so I didn't do much last week on this, but I'm hoping to wrap it up this week now that the patch is out of the way. Uh, I want to try out the new uh, SD card support in web workflow. Uh, belated hug report to Scott for that. That looks super cool. Um, and then outside of CircuitPython, I have been uh, still keeping up with the advent of code and TryHackMe's admin of cyber. Uh, I've had lots of fun with both of those, and I've learned a lot from completing the, uh, the daily challenge. So that's been very cool. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Dan. All right. Um, so uh, we're getting ready for a 900 Alpha 6 release. Could be within the next day or two. Um, I blogged this problem that we've been seeing with macOS Sonoma where you get delayed writes and it really messes with using CircuitPy. So I blogged it on the Adafruit blog and then reposted that with a little explanation on Mastodon as myself and as CircuitPython. And that, that got some traction. I got like a dozen like boosts and stuff like that. And also people subscribe, people um, added CircuitPython to themselves, to their um, follow lists also. So maybe some more people will, will report this bug, which is we can additionally try to get um, Apple more interested in it. Um, I wrote up a, I did some testing um, of which USB serial chips are supported on macOS in which versions of macOS. When did, was, was native support added to those? Because it's very confusing when that might have happened. And I was able to roll back two old Macs to some really old versions and then roll them forward and test uh, FTDDI and CP2104 and CH9102F chips. And so I wrote that up as a playground note, and it will eventually be incorporated into the appropriate learn guides. So that's what's going on right now. And I'm fixing, working on 9 also. All right. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you, Dan. Next up is David Glada, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, David says, uh, CircuitPython a couple weeks ago uh, tested the BT home protocol with code from, uh, with code, uh, excuse me, with code from in CircuitPython, I think tested uh, in CircuitPython using underscore BLEIO code from the, uh, let's see, from Cohen Vervosium. 
uh, see in the weeds for more on that. So we'll discuss that a little later, it looks like. Uh, for CircuitPython this week, David says, investigating my, why my doorbell music started at least twice in a week without anybody pressing the button. Uh-oh, uh, only the CircuitPython board triggered. And investigating the debouncing option to see if we could reduce uh, false positive triggers. Uh, Non-CircuitPython over in Arduino land, David reports this week, uh, spending six hours helping a student prepare for an exam uh, and to find a project to build. Uh, the project is a school traffic light that stops car traffic at the press of a button. It includes beeps for additional accessibility. Uh, reviewed one more time, uh, pull up, pull down, and internal pull up in order to explain the various ways to do a button. Uh, I always have to review those myself as well when I sit down to work on a different one. Um, tested the code and made some nice schematics uh, in the simulator uh, at wowkwee.com, wok, uh, which is a super cool uh, simulator for folks that haven't seen it that's able to um, emulate or simulate CircuitPython devices. Really neat stuff. Uh, all right, next up is uh, DJ Devin. Uh, you, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, this week, a GUI touch version of the Featherweather is coming along nicely. At one point, it was 1,700 lines using only if-else statements. After a week of frustration, I got every page working and refactored it down with functions to just about under 1,000 lines. Uh, Circuit Python touch GUIs are more complex than I imagined. Uh, ran into a problem not being able to display the Wi-Fi radio RSSI on a TFT easily. There are a lot of examples for printing it in REPL, but I couldn't find it, a single example of doing it on a TFT. Um, so with the help of OpenAI and an hour of teaching it syntax, it finally led me to something that I could output to a TFT. It doesn't quite work perfectly. It has display I.O. group appending issues that I'm still sorting out, but it, everything works pretty well okay. Uh, this morning, I was able to increase the GUI menu responsiveness, so it's really quick to respond now. And that is in particular in thanks to user LCMNC Niche, who spotted a way to improve the Adafruit button example code, and there's an issue on that. Uh, and then right before the meeting, someone popped into CircuitPython chat and found a new last minute bug by Lindahl Engineering where an ESP32 S3 reverse TFT will not display due to an attribute error. Neither display.show or root group work. And I will file a bug shortly. Nice. Thank you, DJ Devin. Uh, next up, we will hear from Jeff. Hello again. Uh, so last week, like the most exciting thing was I ran into a rig problem with just one of my many OV5640 camera modules. There were artifacts that you would see only in the JPEG output. And uh, since you, you've all seen the Memento camera, so Adafruit is you know preparing to put out a lot of this product. And this is something that the in-house testing process wouldn't see. So Lamar had me write a test for this kind of defect, and they may end up adding it to the in-factory testing procedure before those uh, boards go out. I haven't heard the latest on that, but uh, basically, and if you have a module that uh, sounds like it's having something like this going on, please get in touch with us because, you know, between all of us, we've maybe tested 20 or 50 of the camera modules, and so we don't necessarily know all the kinds of interesting defects that show up. But uh, basically, there would be artifacts that repeat vertically in the image every 16 pixels, and they're about the same no matter what uh, you're actually taking a picture of. And it's only when you're in JPEG mode. You don't see it if you're just displaying an RGB image to the built-in display, for instance. Uh, so that was fun. Um, in other news, the JPEG I.O. module is now merged to the main branch. So the next 9 pre-release is going to have that on a lot of boards. This module lets you uh, decode JPEGs as long as they fit into the CircuitPython available RAM. Um, and that's pretty cool. And next up, the Espressif.clock frame buffer, Melissa mentioned this, had a hidden requirement that the frame buffer had to be a multiple of 16 pixels across. That's because like a fundamental, I think, cache unit of um, Espressif boards is 32 bytes. We had a display that actually needed 360 pixels. So internally, the size is now rounded up and a non-displaying part is added at the right side of this display if necessary. So internally this display becomes 360 pixels wide and that works. Uh, so next up, I am going to adapt an existing guide that uses uh, Display I.O. and Adafruit I.O. to display a JPEG image on a CircuitPython board and I'm going to redo that uh, using Qualia 
and uh, using JPEG I.O. So it doesn't require Adafruit I.O. to display a JPEG image. Like there's one that I think uh, fetches space-based images that are, are free on the internet. Uh, and of course, that's always pretty cool. Um, and then I have to check back tomorrow to see if the bundle makes a correct release with binary files. This is something that we wanted for the uh, OV5640 camera, the Qualia board, all that stuff. Um, I had merged in a needed change to Circuit Python build tools, but because I did not make a release, the bundle hasn't been using that to actually build. So I tagged the release this morning, and as soon as there's a new bundle release, I will go back and check that the uh, camera's uh, autofocus firmware is part of the um, bundle. So after that, I have a daydream that's related to this facility to um, build bundles that have binary files. It would be really neat to have a font bundle. Naradoc did this thing, belated hug report Naradoc, uh, which is a bundle of many, many different keyboard layouts. And they're not like individually written libraries, they're generated libraries. And then you can install like, for instance, just the keyboard layout for a Windows computer in France or a Mac computer in um, Germany. And, that, and then send USB HID, like typing out words that still work despite the, the different keyboard layouts. Anyway, this shows uh, that we could, for instance, generate a lot of uh, libraries within one bundle, and each library would contain one font, such as Adafruit font mono bold 24. Um, it would be pretty cool if we could have this, and then we wouldn't have to, you know, copy a TTF file or generate a PDF file from a TDF file and copy it into each of our projects. Um, I'm not going to do that right now, but if somebody wants to take this idea and run with it, you would be an awesome person. Um, anyway, then a couple of other project ideas. I mentioned earlier uh, the software UV tools. Um, and together with Prusa Slicer, you can use these as open source alternatives to the proprietary software that's bundled with the printer. I'm always happier when I can use open source software to do my stuff. And my like one week review of resin printing, the results are really cool. They are so much more uh, organic looking than something you get from a 3D printer um, or so much smoother just because the layers are so fine. They're like 0.05 millimeters instead of uh, 0.2 millimeters. Uh, however, everyone will warn you that the, the, the resin is uncomfortable to be around and dealing with the cleanup and, and just not harming yourself by getting the resin on your body. It is a really huge pain and my basement is not super well ventilated unless I can open up the outside. So the winter time is not really a good time to do this and I'm going to have to put it away basically until the weather improves. Um, yeah, so just be aware of that when you think about getting a resin printer. It's, it's just so many times worse than a uh, filament printer in my experience. Um, yeah, and then in other other news, I wrote a two-factor authentication app that runs in the terminal and released it on GitHub. So if you use the Google Authenticator app, uh, this is an alternative to that that you can run on your computer. And I'm like user zero, I don't think there's a user one yet, but uh, you know, it's open source on the internet. And this library textual has really made it fun to develop terminal-based applications again. I like it a lot. If that's something that uh, you think you would want to do, I recommend picking up this library. It works with uh, Python, not with CircuitPython, but just with standard Python. And you can do a lot, and it's like got a, a modern vibe, but also like that pre-Windows vibe of everything was just made out of text. Um, and so I like it a lot. Anyway, uh, going on for a long time, but that's what I've been up to. All right, yeah, thank you, Jeff. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. So uh, I finished up my Qualia library guide, and I did a huge refactor on CircuitPython.org that required ed editing every board file uh, so that mo multiple URLs can be associated with them. Um, I added missing boards to CircuitPython.org and fixed the board's API so that the so that valid JSON is now produced. Uh, I added. Uh, the bar displays to the Qualia library and, and also the guide. I forgot to write that down. Um, 
And I tested some uh, bug fixes in CircuitPython that Jeff had mentioned and stuff. Uh, I reviewed and merged uh, some more Blinka PRs. I added the 2.8 inch round display to the Qualio guide as well. And I needed, I need to still add the new displays to the Arduino section of the guide and I need to work on updating some of the Raspberry Pi installer scripts. And that's where I'm at. All right, thank you, Melissa. And uh, next up is Scott. Hello. Okay, so uh, my parents are at my house and will likely be until my mom goes into hospice, so I'm, I'm out off and on still. Uh, I'm catching up on email. Uh, last week, the deep dive was my last of the year. Uh, thanks again to Tim for deep diving on Friday this week, and then uh, neither of us will deep dive the two following weeks. Uh, so that'll take us into the new year. That reminds me, speaking of the new year, and, and David, uh, thank you for the reminder that uh, we will be doing CircuitPython 2024, which is our call for folks to, to say what they like about CircuitPython, what they want to do in the coming year, kind of like the big item, big ticket items that we want to work on as a community, and you know what projects and things. So we will be doing that, and I'll, I'll do a quick post on New Year's Day to kick it off. And then uh, we'll, we should start thinking about our own and, and do those. And we already have the email set up. So um, if you do do one early, you can email circuitpython2024 at adafruit.com and it should get to me and Phil, uh, Phil Tyrone. Um, CircuitPython wise, I'm doing, uh, I, I made a PR for SD card support in the web workflow, but all the NRFs uh, with BLE workflow broke. Um, so I made it a draft again uh, because I decided to do a bit more refactoring uh, to allow one to share code between BLE and web workflows, but also uh, to switch us to per file system locking. So now, now we're we're managing multiple file systems, both like the SD card and the and the normal internal root. Um, and by refactoring it, I'm going to add uh, SD card support to the BLE workflow as well. Um, and then what will happen is like the USB workflow will lock the file systems pretty aggressively because because it's block level support. Uh, but between BLE and web workflow, it should be able to do the locking on a like per transaction basis instead of like USB where we don't know where transactions end until it's ejected. So uh, worked on that, and uh, that should be cool prep work for when we get back to BLE IO on Espressif in the coming year and are able to do BLE workflow and web workflow from the same chip. That's my update. All right. Thank you, Scott. Uh, and that is it for status updates. So that will bring us into the fifth and final section for the meeting in the weeds. Uh, as a reminder, In the Weeds is an opportunity for some more long-form discussions. Those can either have come out of status updates or been identified ahead of time. Uh, if you do have an In the Weeds topic and you have not already added it to the doc, please go ahead and do that right now. We have a couple here, so you've got a moment while we work through those. Um, but as always, just list those In the Weed topics down at the bottom of the uh, document. So uh, first in the weeds document was mine and I uh, attached a text file in there that was just a list of all of the remaining issues that came out of the library patch and release sweep. Uh, I believe everything in this document will require either access to the repo settings or something else inside GitHub like that that I don't have access to. Uh, and I just dropped it here because I didn't want it to get lost in the shuffle in um, GitHub. So I don't know if there's too much to discuss unless if anybody has got questions or comments on it. Um, but I just wanted to put it here to make sure it was somewhere that didn't just scroll past us, like on the Discord. Uh, one, one question I have for you, Tim, is do you know what like the standard settings should be? I um, do not. I, 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 I um made some changes which I thought were correct and they weren't, so I'm going to take a look at this. Okay. I mean, they started reminding us that there weren't branch protection rules, and I... So I added branch protection rules, not realizing that would break some automated stuff. 
Mm, okay. So I, I will undo that. Okay. Okay. Either that or we need to exempt the Adabot account from the branch protection rule. Yeah, but it was so hard the, to do that. And the patches work a little bit differently. The patches, as far as I understand it, when you run that patch manually, so not like the actions and stuff that Adabot runs with cron inside GitHub, but when you do oh. like a manual patch like I did, those commits come from whichever GitHub token you use, which is the user's token. Okay. Okay. So, so we can uh, exempt you from it. Yeah, or yeah, whoever is running, if there's a way to do lists like that. I mean, the protection rules, we almost never have people violate the explicit rules anyway, so it's not clear yeah. it's worth enforcing them. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And then the other one, the only other ones that were different were like, um, my best guess was it just either didn't have the token or the token was expired or different for some reason than the other libraries. There was only, I think, one or two like that, and then the rest were the branch protection thing. Okay, and it sounds like Dan will look at all of those for you. Yeah, so I have, yeah, I have the token stashed away, and I can put it, add it to those. Cool, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Didn't we intend to use an organization-wide token as the, the default, or am I thinking of a PyPI thing? Uh, that might be correct, and so maybe there's an incorrect token. Yeah, or maybe that, that one repo is not set up the same in the organization, perhaps, or something like that. Because I was thinking the same, where it was like somehow shared between all the libraries, not that they all had to have it set independently. So I was thrown, thrown off by that error when it did pop up. There is a GH repo token uh, Adafruit organization level secret. And I would have guessed that that would be the one that it should use and then that a repository level one should not be used. But if it's there, it would be used. You know, it would override it. Yep. Maybe that repo does not belong to the org the same way or something like that link that ties those two together is somehow broken or different could be the case on that one. Okay. Um, alrighty. Yep. Thank you to everyone. Uh, Next up is David Glauda, who's text only, so I'll read. Uh, David puts here that we can read the uh, the TLDR version, which is that uh, a Belgian book author, um, uh, yeah, a Belgian book author about Bluetooth on microcontrollers used underscore BLE in CircuitPython, uh, underscore BLEIO in CircuitPython because he had trouble with the BLE documentation. Uh, maybe someone can check if it's possible to do it without underscore BLEIO or contact the author to see what can be improved from the documentation standpoint. Um, and then I'm guessing that this GitHub link is to the book or no? Maybe like the uh, the book's companion code, so to speak. Um, he, yeah. he didn't, he's, he is a book author, but he did not put this code in a book. I see, okay. Yeah. So, it's correct that the, there is not there is not general documentation about the Adafruit BLE library. There should be a guide, a general guide, but there is not. Okay. We always refer people to the examples. So okay. that that's that's a deficiency that sh should be a long term documentation issue or something. So. Okay, for the general uh, BLE guide. Okay, yeah, Sounds like we know. You know the path forward then there. I don't know if there's a um, issue in GitHub or anywhere, but maybe it's appropriate to make uh, that somewhere just so it doesn't get lost in the shuffle or something. Uh, yeah. David. Cool. Um, all right, and then uh, last item in the weeds is for you, Dan. I'll, uh, I'll pass it over to you. Just I think that everything that I would want in Alpha dot six is done. The only the only there's Scott's draft. Um, SD card workflow thing, but I think we could push that to later if we want. Yeah, I wouldn't hold it up for it. I think because I don't think the workflow and fixes that were already done have been released yet, so it'd be nice to get an alpha out. Yeah, so I, I will just I, I just merged a um a, uh, a a translations update, and I may or may not update the I could update the frozen modules too probably, and then I could do a release. 
yeah. tonight or tomorrow or something. Frozen, uh, frozen modules I do think would be good. I've seen a couple of issues pop up in libraries where it's stemming, I think, from out-of-date stuff in the Frozen ones, so I'd definitely be in favor of that. I, I will do that then, yeah. And okay. I, think, I think that'll have the new IDF update too, right? That's right. It'll have the 5.1.2 update, yeah. Yep. That's good too. Yeah. There was also, yeah, I think it's good to do. And right, there was something about the reverse TFT isn't working or something. Maybe that was an A29. But I'll mm. I'll, I'll check that briefly. Also, okay, yeah, that's great. I'm I'm inputting the uh, bug report for that right now. Okay. Excellent. I think it should still be an alpha cuz I am in my draft I'll change the behavior of storage.mount. So that'll be that's a breaking API change. Okay. Because yeah, with this with this draft PR, you'll be able to you'll be required to make a directory to mount to instead of the current way that it works in eight is that it errors if the directory exists. Um, but forcing you to have made it already means that it gets listed in the parent, which is what you know Linux does already. Okay. All right, and that is our last in the weeds topic. So with that, I will get us into the wrap up. Uh, let's see. So this has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for December 11th, 2023. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, as a reminder, again, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on the major podcast services. Uh, it'll also get featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which you can visit uh, adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that if you like. Um, the next meeting, I believe, is Monday. However, I did not actually into that, so let me uh, try to pull that up real fast here, unless if anybody happens to know. I think we're on Monday next week. The, the next meeting is Monday, December 18th at the usual time. But note that that is our last meeting of the year. The meeting after that will be on Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024. Awesome. Yes, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, with that, we will say that's the next meeting. Yep, uh, on the Adafruit Discord, as always, uh, you can join at adafru.it slash discord. Uh, you do need the CircuitPythonista's role if you want to speak, and another perk of that role is you'll get notified of changes to the scheduled meetings, such as the ones that we'll be skipping coming up uh, a couple of uh, weeks. So with that, uh, thank you everyone again, and we'll see you all next week.